My beginnings were as a commercial fisherman, and my job was to catch big fish and sell them for money, which is nothing wrong with that. But what I realized was that because I had grown up as a really little kid, free to like run through the woods and get lost and get scraped up and you know just play and explore nature. By the time I got to be the age where I had to like make a decision about what I wanted to do with my life, the natural sort of thing to do is to kind of become a fisherman in the place that I grew up. That's up in New England. That's where that was. And um, I didn't know this until recently, like what this was about. But what it was about was the fact that I had this long relationship with these creatures of the world, nature, crabs, fish, frogs, even like the seaweed and the water and the mud of the bay. And then I got to a point in life where I was being asked to convert that whole experience as a child into something as a, a commodity. A commodity is something that is just for, done for money. Not that there's anything wrong with money, but the idea was to convert this thing that I thought was magical. Like I lived in an enchanted world as a child. And then suddenly there was this moment where it was crystal clear that after I caught, when I caught that tuna, 800 pounds, that's, a, that's bigger than this table, it was this gigantic animal. And like when I watched it die, it was kind of like it was saying, all right, you caught me. You caught me because the habitats that you grew up in taught you how to catch me. And that tuna wanted me to know what I was forfeiting, what I was, what I was giving up was that sort of child's relationship with, those, with that world in order to sell it. And all my buddies on the boat were like patting me on the back. Everybody was excited because we were going to get all this money for this fish. And I felt everybody was like, great job. You know? And I knew why I caught that fish. I caught that fish because every animal that I had handled, every bird that I had watched, every frog that I had caught, you know, every salamander had taught me how to do that. And I was, and, and that tuna wanted me to know, at least this is the way I interpret it, that I was putting all of that behind me so that I could be an adult and convert that, that relationship that I had with nature into money. That's nothing wrong with that, but I'm just saying it was like, that was like a moment of like having to come to face that reality that it was get, putting behind me that child's understanding and experience of the world in order to like make money. And, and, and the opportunity that was in that moment was that I could make a decision that I didn't necessarily want to do that. And that's when I decided to really get serious about school and go back to school. And that's why I decided to study marine biology and oceanography, and that's how I got into science. Anyway, so that's, I don't mean to go on too long about that, but I don't, I'm not sure if I communicated that in the film itself, but it was something that I, I now understand, was that that was the price of that lesson, was that tuna. And I wanted to make sure I did that justice, that tuna justice. Do you have a question? So, like, are you trying to convey that there's, like, beauty in looking at the world through, like, a childhood? Yeah. Yes. And that you don't have to forfeit it just to be an adult. Like, you keep that alive. You can keep that, that, call it passion, call it sense of curiosity, sense of um, enchantment is the, is the best word, I think. I'm a scientist, okay? So I'm trained in the sciences. So nothing I'm going to say tonight betrays the sciences. Nothing that I'm going to say is outside of the scientific worldview, but it might sound like it. It might actually start to sound like I have a spiritual connection to nature, and I do. But I'm still a scientist. But I'm in love with it. I'm in love with, I'm in love with nature. And I do feel like there's, kind of a, there's a kind of magic. Not a supernatural magic, but a natural magic in nature. So yeah, that's, to answer your question, yes. That's what I was trying to say. But I, I, don't, I think you can retain that throughout your whole life. 
And if you do, you live a wicked full life if you can retain that. Wicked full. You can tell you're from New England when you say wicked yeah, full. Yeah, that's a Massachusetts word. <laughs> Normally say wicked pissa, which is actually what clams do. When you walk by clams sometimes, they'll, squ they'll squirt up out of the mud. That's a wicked pissa clam. <laughs> yeah. I guess my question then is uh, when do you become an adult? Because if you can keep the mindset or whatever, then like, is being an adult just a, a title or are you like, entering a new mindset that also encapsulates the... Great question. I think what you're talking about, like the way you just said that, like you're saying, you're questioning the categories that we use to define what it is to be a child, what it is to be an adult. And then you said this new thing, where there's an adult that keeps the child alive. That's kind of like a third thing. Like a, when you put it that way, you can think of that, you can think of what you just said across all kinds of different domains. It's kind of fractal. In other words, the thing that shows up in one, at one scale can show up at another. But so, the fractal that what your question brings to my mind is that there's a continuity and that you don't have to, there's no hard breaks between what it means to be an adult and a child. And there's actually no hard break between what it means to be a child, an adult, or this third thing you're talking about, the adult that keeps the child's way of seeing the world alive. But all those things are on the same continuum. Yeah. In a sense, what it is, what I, what, what, and I study the cosmos, the universe, and what I see when I study the cosmos is differentiation along a continuum. So yeah, in one sense, they're all the same thing because they're all on the continuum. But there's differentiation along that continuum. And guess what? If you look at the history of the universe, it's, that sa it's the same story. If you look at the way that the universe has evolved since the Big Bang, it started, you know, in the cosmic microwave background radiation, and it has evolved. It's complexified. It's differentiation along a continuum, just like a human lifespan is differentiation along a continuum. This is an idea that I call continuity, or it's called continuity. Does anyone know what continuity means? It's kind of a it's kind of a big word, but it just means this. It means that everything is continuous, that there's, a, there's no real hard breaks between anything. So in some sense, yeah, it is all one. Okay. Differentiation along a continuum. So if it's getting too, it may, this might be getting like too philosophical, but that's OK. That's too philosophical? No. Did you have a question? Did you want to ask? Uh, no, I was just going to like talk to like. I was just going to help define what continuity means. What happened? Yeah, what do, you, what do you think? Um, I mean, like, I've taken, like, AP World and stuff like that, and continuity is kind of, like, you know, same over, like, a period of time. You've taken what? AP World. What's that? It's like an AP class. Like World History? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Ah. Well, let me ask you a question. In AP World History, did the continuity of world history extend into geologic history? Geologic history. I mean, sometimes. I can't remember. Like, I mean, we looked at a lot of documents. And I mean, like, how about, maybe there's something. How about the fossil record? That's what I'm asking. Fossil record? Yeah. It, it's like, we talked about 200 AD and onward. Yeah, yeah. OK. It's not. It's only, like, they talk, oh, it's, it's mostly, it's like human onward. OK, but do you see how then it kind of lacks continuity? Because it could. Because where does human history start? Tell me where does human history start in AP history? Um, I mean, human history? I mean, the first thing I think of is like the, the, the Lucy time. Like that. Yeah, OK. So that's 3.2, 3.8 million years ago. Does AP history go back that far? No. So it doesn't really have continuity with like the rest of history. human history. 
Well, why doesn't human history start even before that? Say, in the history of primates, seven million years ago. Or say, where our lineage split from the chimps eight million years ago. I'm just, I'm just asking a hypothetical question here. Like, doesn't it start there? Or, or can it even start further back when, like, the dinosaurs went extinct 65 million years ago? Because that opened up a whole niche for those little mammals to get a foothold to start. That's really where it started, right? No, actually, but wait a minute. You, this, this is the thing. This is the thing that happens when you start really looking at history. If you really want to know what, why things happened, you have to understand the context in which they started. And then you end up back at the Big Bang. I mean, let's just, that's, and that's what cosmology is. It's the study of the whole story in a way that's continuous. Physical history, geologic history, human history. It's, continu it's, it's differentiation along a continuum. This is the kind of thinking that my field, which is sometimes it's called big history, sometimes it's called cosmic evolution, deep history. This is what you have to kind of grapple with, is that kind of continuity. Did you have another question? One of, of what? One of what? Okay, so like we're talking specifically, right, uh, like human history got mentioned, right? Mm -hmm. And so if we're talking about like the impact of human history, like you can go back and pinpoint one, but that one was a cause of two, which was five, which was ten, which was an infinite amount of things. So, and this is probably too. Is it infinite, though? I mean, I don't know. First of all, there's a big mystery that's written into the whole thing, okay, that even science doesn't know and maybe can't know. So once we acknowledge that there's a big, deep mystery back at the Planck constant, the Planck time, 10 times something to, to the negative 43 seconds, Right? Yes. Physics starts to break down at those scales, mm -hmm. which means we don't currently have a way of understanding things that happen that far back in time and at those tiny little scales. There's mystery. So once we have that mystery established and we can all say, all right, there's a big mystery here. But then we can start asking questions about what we do know. And that's what science does. It builds, it takes that mystery it puts it aside, holds it, and then starts answering questions through the scientific method. And it's answered a lot of questions. Not all of them. Thank goodness, because when then what, where, what good is curiosity? If, if this, but the point is, there is a deep mystery that we just need to, we just need to accept. So, I don't know if we want to pick that up later, but we'll see where we got. Okay. Did you have another question? Hey, thanks, guys. I really appreciate this that you kind of participating. So. So, I I was watching a video the other night. It was like all of Earth's history, and if you look at the video, it's one second, it's one million years. So, there's only like recognizable animals for like the last seven minutes, and that just kind of boggled my mind. It's like, yeah. Billions upon billions of years for life and yeah. cellular organisms. But I, I guess what I was going to say is, is was there the headline that, you know, Earth's supercontinents won't, or we'll have a supercontinent that won't be suitable for humans in 250 million years? Like, how do you think about the world, I guess, when, when our, our existence is just so small? You know, we have, we have you know, 100 years, maybe, and well, there's a lot built into your question about, well, there, I, I teach this thing big history. It's the history of the cosmos. And then, I, and then after I teach it, I teach it at the college level, I ask the students, like, what are some of the feelings or what are some of the, what are the things that it makes you think? 
And one of the things is it makes people feel very insignificant. I feel tiny. I feel so insignificant in the span of all of this. But if you actually stick with it, if you actually keep with it, don't give up at that point where you feel insignificant, suddenly you start to realize that, wait a minute, we hold all this. We're the inheritors of this whole story. In some sense, that makes us incredibly significant. So you start to go from feeling insignificant to significant. So that's one thing I think your question is sort of asking is like, how do you go from feeling insignificant? How do you get over this insignificance hump and become insignificant? Because then with that significance comes purpose, meaning, and agency. You can make a difference in the world because you're significant. The other thing was about the con we'll have another continent will be unsuitable for humans in a couple hundred million years. Well, what are humans going to be in a that you're judging the suitability of, of, for humans based on what we are today? Who are we going to be in a hundred million years? Is the question. Maybe we won't need a suitable continent that we need today. This is a question of our imagination. Can we imagine what it's can we, can we imagine what we will be? Maybe we won't even need to inhabit space like we do right now in 100 million years. But I'll tell you this, we won't get there until we, if we don't learn how to get along, if we don't learn how to take care of each other, if we don't learn how to take better care of the planet. And... Um, so, so I think inherent in your question also is a call to come up with better ways of governing ourselves and, and, and cherishing our situation and our planet. Rich, you, um, your tuna story yeah. video, when you saw the tuna or watched the tuna die, yeah. this was a transformative moment in your life. Yeah. It transformed you, you that. from a money hungry fisherman well, I wouldn't say to that. Yeah. a uh, person who was interested in learning about the world and science. And you mentioned something before we started this, uh, something called Kairos, which I think is some other kind of mm. uh, transform transformation. Mm. You want to Maybe sure. tell them a little bit about that. Sure. First of all, I think to, to characterize it like that, like maybe the way I did, is a bit simplistic because it took me a long time to figure out what that transformation was. I didn't just go from being a money-hungry fisherman to whatever. But it flipped the switch. It definitely, but it was mostly in <clears throat> hindsight. It was like looking back at that moment and being like, wow, that really mattered. And then it took me 30 years to figure out what the heck just happened, you know? So, um, but what you mentioned, what, what John mentioned was um, um, this word called the kairos. Kairos is a Greek word that refers to a kind of time. There's, there's actually three Greek words that refer to time. The first one is, you're probably familiar with, it's chronos. Chronos is linear time. You know how time goes, days go by. Kairos refers to a different kind of time where profound and massive transformation is happening through crisis. That's what we're going through right now. We're in a kairotic moment. But here's the thing about the Greeks. <laughs> they were complex thinkers and embedded within the crisis is an equally profound opportunity. That's what kairos means. And I'm, I guess I'm kind of curious if you guys feel this. I mean, like, you know, we've been around a while, and so we can kind of feel the difference between the world as it was 20, 30, 40, 50, even 50 years ago. And we can feel that there's a major change happening in our society, in our climate, in our world order. Can you guys feel that? Because this is like the world you're inheriting. You're inheriting the, the Kairos. And I'm curious what you're going to do with it. 
And I'm hoping that like you can take all the wisdom of that that humans have been able to gain from the world through science and 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 scholarship and and the human endeavor for knowledge and put it to use in a really third way not the way we've done it in the past not the way we're doing it now but a way that's like categorically different that's like on your shoulders and i'm hoping that this story that i'm telling you about i i see your hand I'm, i'll ask you in a second but i'm hoping that this story that I'm telling you about how the earth kind of speaks to us if we're willing to listen, how it shares its, sorry, but its intelligence, its knowledge, how it shows us its complexity, it's how it shows us how it's resilient and how we might be able to adopt that at resilience in our own ways because we've lost it. Just like my little kid got, I was being asked to forfeit the little kid Humanity's being asked to forfeit its knowledge, the knowledge that this earth has, imp has imprinted on us through our entire evolutionary history. Like, you're being asked to remember that now because we're going to need it. And if we don't get that right, you can forget about 100 million years from now. We can just, you know, we're not going to be around, really. So the Kairos is this moment that we're all living into. It's incredibly transformative, but there's also a profound opportunity to change the way we do things. And it's fallen right into your capacity to do something about it right now. Um, and I think, you know, this talk is, is billed as like a dual. It's the sciences and the humanities. Because my work is really, cuts across the sciences and the humanities. I work with a lot of artists, I do a lot of creative, cultural change work that's informed by science, I think that's what it's going to take. It's going to take a, you're all going to need to be savvy across the, those, that, that artificial divide between the sciences and the humanities. It's an artificial divide. The sciences and the humanities are one of those differentiations along a continuum. But we cast them as they're categorically different, and they're not. To be a really good humanities scholar, you've got to be a good critical thinker. You know, you've really got to have knowledge about the way the world works, including nature. And if you, to be a really good scientist, you need to have deep imaginative powers. You've got to be a really creative thinker. See how there's like crossover? That's what it's going to take. Sorry, I don't mean to get too prescriptive here. but. I'll get to you. Well, she has one question before, but you're next. I was going to say, for our generation, I feel like um, I have seen changes since the pandemic because I feel like people don't think about nature as much growing up. Like people born after the pandemic don't really think about nature as much because everything they know is on like a tablet or something. So they can just learn from that rather than they don't have to go outside because they didn't need to before. So I don't know if that, that's me. Hmm. When you say people born after the pandemic, they would be three years old. Yeah, the tablet kids. She's talking about the tablet kids. Ah. Like three-year-olds who can't function without a tablet. Or even like one-year-olds who were born through the pandemic. Wow. Or at least the people like five years younger than us are older than us. Yeah, but they were still like very developed, like the pandemic impacted their development years in a way that, like, for our, like, many generations, we're still technically the same generation. Yeah. Almost, but, like, for Gen Alpha, like, the five and six-year-olds, yeah. it impacted them in ways that they're going to remember yeah. and everything, and in such developmental ways mm -hmm. and that it changes. It All changes right. Well, let, so let, me, let, me, let me say this. Like, what you saw on that film, right, that's me. I went around the world several times. I sailed across oceans, I've been top of Kilimanjaro 11 times, been South America, North, you know, everywhere. It doesn't require that to get what I'm talking about, you know? I, as I was coming in today, there's this little cycad garden out here, you know, these little, these little, these ancient 300 million year old plants. 
There's a garden of them out there. That's the kind of thing that can also like, reconnect you with nature. You don't have to cross an ocean or climb a mountain or... Of course, these things are good if, if you're up for it, but I'm just saying, like, tablets are all right. They're not, they're not the enemy, you know? They can open up access and give us access to and inspire us to have a relationship with nature in your backyard, you know, or just on your drive home when you're going over the, over the rip, over the bay, look, look out there, see what's out there, you know, look away from the things and, and, and just, look, set up a hammock in your yard and a bird will come. That's, that's good, too. Like that's, that's a way to have a relationship with nature as well. It doesn't, have, doesn't require a huge world-crossing adventure. So there's still hope, even though we are tablet kids. Yeah. I was just saying, like, I, I wish there were people who cared about nature the way that you do more, like, more often. Yeah, I hear that, too. Let me say another thing. When I started this work, right, I thought if I could reach 10% of people and get them to fall in love with nature like I am, then would, you know, that'd be good. I've had to like downgrade my expectations. It's, and then I was at like 1%. And now I'm actually like at 0.1%. It doesn't take everybody to feel this way. It does take key people, like key, people who have the, the sensitivity, and the, the call, if you feel called to this, that's really important. And then you can inspire other people. But we don't all have to have, we don't all have to live like this. But we have to be able to show people that it's possible and get people to care. Um, so anyway, I don't think we, but we do need to remember that, that this is within all of us, by the way. If you look at the history of humanity, what you realize is that human beings, every human being alive today, it doesn't matter what your skin color is, what your ethnicity is, what continent you're from, what country you're from, it doesn't matter. Every human being alive today has inherited an evolutionary story through every habitat on this planet. And it's in us all. Our bodies, even our like minds, hold the intelligence of, this, of, of every habitat on this planet within us. And so we all have this, even if we don't go around doing what I'm doing. <laughs> so, one sec. Yeah? Um, I don't know if I just saying catch on earlier, but my question is like, what is like the purpose? Like what do we benefit from reconnecting with like, nature? We don't go extinct. <laughs> First of all. <laughs> Second of all, it's the most fulfilling, joyful, beautiful, gratitude-filled sense of interconnection and wisdom on the planet. We have everything to gain from it, reconnecting to who we are. We heal the injury of the disconnect that we're all now currently suffering. I hold the belief that most of the world's problems today are caused because we feel separated from our origin story, which separates us from each other. It's because of that, I think, that injury, whether we acknowledge it or not, that causes us, or let's say, uh, encourages us to mistreat each other. And I think that's the root of a lot of the problems. So to answer your question, we have a lot to gain by reconnecting to nature. I think it will help us heal, not just the planet, but ourselves. And then we'll have the wisdom to, to, to govern ourselves better, to not get into ridiculous ideological wars, or do, to, to, to extract and exploit each other in ways that harm each other this is, this is what I think we, this is seriously what I think we have to gain from reconnecting to nature. It, it'll, it'll bring back our sanity as a species. 
I know these are, I know these are strong words, but I think there's some truth to them. <laughs> yeah. Did the tuna transform you into a vegan? Good question. Did the tuna transform me into a vegan? No. But what it did do is compel me to respect and appreciate what I, what I do. And if I eat meat or if I cause harm in the world, it's, it's, it's taught me to take responsibility for that harm and to feel it. Do you see what I mean? I don't, and I do. Like when I, it, it causes me to think about my actions and take ownership of the harm that I do in the world. That's a responsibility that I have now. That doesn't mean I don't eat meat, but it means that I try not to create harm because I feel the harm that I'm creating. And I think knowing the evolutionary history of our bodies and our, 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 our metabolism, our physiology, I think I've tried to be a vegetarian and I just, I can't function. <laughs> I, I need the protein. So, um, but it does make me aware of, it makes me care deeply about my actions. And I, so I consider them. Yeah. And this, when you talk about like the harm, do you necessarily think like the overconsumption and like the industrialization of like, like fishing and like yeah. um, cattle farming and everything? Because do you think like the people like thousands of years ago who were connected with nature, who like were sustenance and everything, like, were they causing harm when they killed buffaloes? I, I, I think, that going back to the injury, I think we feel because we feel separated from nature. We feel alienated from nature, and I think we all kind of carry around this sort of like pain of that. It causes us to try and heal that pain by hyper-consuming, by consuming a lot. That's how we try to heal the pain. And this gets back to your question, like what benefit do we have? We'll stop hyper-consuming. We'll stop, con we'll stop consuming the world like the way we do. So I don't want to get too political, but so that, I hope that answers your question. One second, she has a question. Yeah. Yeah. Um, because I'm a scientist and I'm trained that this is like. This, it, I, I, I'm, I'm trained to be uncomfortable around this conversation. That because science can't get a handle on the mind, we really shouldn't talk about it. And if we are going to talk about it, we should do this. Because then that makes us less of a target amongst our peers. But so like we don't have an explanation for consciousness. I think we do, actually. I think if you look at the history of the way life has evolved, and the, and the way that habitats impinge on organisms, there's a, clear, there's a clear explanation for what mind is. So I actually believe that we have a pretty rigorous reductionist explanation of mind. However, I do that because I'm trained as a scientist and science, and I have to operate in a political world. Does that make any sense? Okay. Did you have a, oh, wait, I'm sorry. When, when I told her I did Yeah. But I, I, didn't, I wasn't sure if you were talking more about humanities and science now, but what did you mean by that? About which one, which part? Uh, that uh, how art kind of influenced science and that you work with it. Well, I guess I was just talking about how to be a really effective and competent leader, whatever you choose, whatever path you choose to go down, you're going to need to be competent across the domains, across transdisciplinary, you know, across disciplines. So it's real leadership starting now is going to require that you're not just a technician, but also a visionary. And that requires being comfortable, being creative and imaginative and analytical. It's a hard role to fill. 
because every, all, all of the incentives are going to try and funnel you into one or the other thing. The real hard thing to do is to be a generalist and be able to operate across. That's, it's, a hard, it's a hard thing to do, but that's, I think, what, what, leader, what the future is going to require of our leaders. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> um, not in the classic sense. I mean, I love those guys. I love the transcendentalists. Like they were like, I love reading their stuff. And but I think they didn't really have the kind of scientific knowledge that we do today. So not in the classic sense. But uh, yeah, maybe in some ways, other ways I do. Yeah, transcendental naturalist. That nature. Look, you can see it. If you, if you really do study nature, you see imagination come into being. And we're all participating in it now. It's a natural phenomenon. So in that sense, yes. I think we have a question over here. Oh, sorry. Did you, anybody over there get ignored? Sorry. I didn't have a question. I, no? I might, but not right now. OK, speak up when you want. This is great. It's a great conversation. I appreciate it. I wonder if you could perhaps briefly tell them what, as future leaders, they can do to navigate this difficulty that is upon us. Has anyone heard the term hemispheric brain theory? There's two, there's two versions of this. There's like the folk psychology version, which like, let's just get that out of the way and say, there's right brain people and there's left brain people. That's not what I'm talking about. That's just like a simplistic thing. But there are two hemispheres to our brain, right? We have two hemispheres, a right and a left. And there's a lot of science right now, a lot of cognitive science that's, that's revealing how the, the, there's a differentiation in the functionality of the two hemispheres. The right hemisphere tends to, tends to see the context of things. It sees the big picture. It sees the relationality of things, whereas the left hemisphere tends to look at the, look at the details, sees, tries to analyze the bits in isolation from each other. Okay? It's, though, it's the fact that these two things are working in opposition to each other. You've got this, this context, big picture, relational side working against, in opposition to the analytical control side, that's actually this, what gives human beings this superpower of our, of our cognitive capacities, that oppositional nature. So what can we do? What can you do? Be aware of this. Be aware that what's happening in our culture now is that the left brain side has hijacked the right brain side. And so that the, the, the people who sort of tend toward the the context and the relationality of things don't get the same power as the people on the left. The technicians have won, have won out and now have sort of taken the power from the other side. So being aware of this dynamic, not only in our culture but in ourselves, is a key to opening up the real superpower that's in your own, that's in your own right brain, left brain compliments. If you can think about the way that our culture is now heavily prefers or is heavily influenced by the more left brain, if you can find a way to see the balance between the right and the left, it's one way to like open up a much more holistic way of thinking. That will set you up to be a more holistic, creative leader in the future. I think that you actually have a, a project that you did with an artist yes. that is connected to this. Am I right? Yes. Would, so Perhaps you would like to show them. Sure, I could show that. Yeah. Um, just So I mentioned that I work with some artists. And so I thought I would just show you real quick 
So if you go to my website, Oika, <coughs> you'll see this page. It's called Extending Ecology. This is at the Museum of the White Mountains in New Hampshire right now. It's a three-year project. Uh, my collaborator is an artist, a visual artist named Rita Leduc. And basically, I'm cast as the scientist. She's cast as the artist. And we have a third collaborator, the forest up in the mountains. And we work together. We spend a lot of time up there in the mountains, in the forest, just being with the trees and, and all that. And now we were invited into this museum gallery up in New Hampshire. And I'll just play some of this video here. I think it should work. So here it is. You can kind of just see our work, some of the photos. A lot of my writing, so it's like, like I'm a scientist, but I'm doing a lot of like creative writing around it. This is the kind of thing that, you know, a kind of collaboration. I'll just kind of zip through it here so you can kind of see the different parts of the installation. So that's my collaborator, Rita. And so she's a painter, she paints things. She also makes different uh, things. This is an experimental forest back in the 80s. This is the place, you've heard of acid rain? Well, this was the place up in New Hampshire where they, they kind of discovered what acid rain was. And they were instrumental in getting the, the, the laws changed to, to, um, to mitigate, um, to mitigate uh, acid rain. But now they've invited us in as a scientist artist team and now we have this exhibition, and the idea is to change culture. So we go in as an artist and a scientist. We spend time in nature. We, we let nature speak to us, in a way. Not like English, but it, like we, we spend time with it. She creates the art. I write the words. It goes into this gallery. And the idea is to bring the intelligence of the forest into the gallery so that the gallery can help nature create the culture. We're trying to create a culture that's aligned with nature by bringing the intelligence of nature into culture through the art. Does that make sense? That's what Oika is about. So here's some of her work. And she's, these are also some of her, these are things that she makes and then they spend time out in the forest. Kind of like when you, when you steep tea in a, be, a tea bag and it's like these things spend time out in the forest just immersed in the ambiance of the forest. But it's just kind of cool that they've given us this opportunity to like create. <clears throat> and then there's a lot of science here too. Like the whole story of the cosmos shows up in this ex exhibition. We went there in the winter time, got the whole sort of uh, intelligence of the place during the during the um, winter. This is some more of the art that she's created. I tell stories about this place like the Gorge, which is this really inaccessible valley that's really hard to get to. And I talk about how the light collects in there and it's really beautiful. And I talk about a lot about the geology of the, of the, of the area. Anyway, so you get the idea here. And these are some of the panels, some of the stories. Here I talk about hemispheric brain theory. Um, yeah. She creates these GIFs, which are little NFTs that are connected to biomarkers in the forest. I create these little films about different artworks. I interpret her works. We do, um, oh, and here's some of the, I do a lot of history of the universe stuff. So for example, there's this whole series on, I'll just skip ahead here. <coughs> I talk about the I talk about the intelligence of the universe. Tell the whole story of the universe. Again, this is that continuum. See how this starts at the beginning of the universe in the mystery? It's called primordia, then celestia, which is the formation of stars, galaxies, and then planets like our own, the earth and earth area, and then animalia, how life emerged and how animals began, and then how humans emerged and then how humans create culture. It's one big long narrative, a story of continuity of nature showing up in this gallery up in the mountains. Anyway, and we do panel, we do discussions on YouTube. I have a, I have a YouTube channel where I 
handle a lot of animals in the woods and teach people how to like interact. And, and uh, we have performance artists come and do things. We have workshops with college students. So this is, this is the uh, collaboration that I do with artists. Yeah. I have to preface this question with a couple things. First of all, I love nature. I love spending time in nature and gardening and planting and everything. Okay. Second, I think you're going to hate this question. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Earlier, way back, you talked about Kairos, right? And okay. how there's time for growth and expansion and how there can be massive awakening, right, of ideas and growth. Would Earth's Kairos be the death of humans? And thus, would our Kairos be our own death if we are trying to save the Earth? I think your question is grounded in a fundamental premise that we're not nature. I mean, I think if we, I think it's all about uh, quantifying, right? And like, if, if we are a subset of nature that is harming the rest of nature, wouldn't our existence not only boost the rest of it, but also create more growth I mean, I guess it's, do you want to keep what you have now or cut the flowers and let them grow more? Yeah, there's nothing to hate about what you're saying. There's nothing to hate. Okay. It's a great question. It's a hard question. Hard to wrap our heads around. There's no doubt we're out of balance. Yeah. And there's something fundamentally wrong with our relationship to nature. But I think we can fix it. I don't, think it's, I don't think we're that far gone that we can fix it. So will we go extinct then? Look, you, you, are not, you, you don't survive any relationship you're in. The very nature of being in a relationship changes you, which means you don't survive it. That doesn't mean you go extinct. It just means who you were no longer is. I don't mean personally myself, but just humans in general. What I said on one scale applies on the other scale. It's going to change us. Does that mean we go extinct? No. But are we going to be who we are now? No. We're going to grow. We're going to change. We're either going to mature or not. And by the way, species go extinct all the time. However, I kind of like our species. And I want to see us thrive. And I, wanna, I want us to be. I want us to flourish, you know? And so, and by the way, I think this is what life is for, is to figure this question out. I think this is the purpose of life. The meaning of life, the universe, and everything is this, to figure out this very question you're asking. I choose to participate. Okay. I choose to be a part of the creative life force of the universe. I know how woo-woo that sounds, I do. But I don't do woo-woo. I have actually reserved I don't do woo-woo.com. So I don't do woo-woo. But I choose to participate in the creative life force of the universe, and it feels good. I have a saying. If you're in right relationship with nature, what feels good is good. I don't have to answer your question. But I choose the light. We have someone over here. And I want to participate in it. Who has been aching who? to ask a question who? for 30 minutes. Speak up. <laughs> Speak up, man. <laughs> That's okay. I, I, you talked about the hemisphere thing, the brain. Have yeah. You about how to split brain patients? Yes, more? yes. Yeah. Some of the most fascinating things. It is. Like, and that's where a lot of the empirical evidence for these theories that I'm talking about come from split brain patient it's studies. Exactly. Yeah, doing. yeah. But don't think for a moment that it's that cut and dry. There's a lot of ambiguity. There's a lot of overlap. There's a lot of plasticity built into the cognitive infrastructure, the, the neural infrastructure of the human brain. Right. It's, it's yeah. So the risk, at the risk of getting too reductionist about it, 
you know, you need to keep track of that. Now you've got a flurry of questions over here okay. on the right now. Yes, right, sorry. Is it that bad? <laughs> no, it's actually really good. Uh, none. None, but I've made every mistake possible, so, and I've gotten skewered a lot, so. Do you find that it's harder to say like, what you truly believe is that you have to have everything with exceptions, and like, it's like how you said, like, it's always ambiguous, so do you find that you have to do that a lot more than what you would have when you started with the field? What I have to do is be careful not to trigger people's narratives about what it is I'm saying. People want to snap what I'm saying to grid. They want to snap to grid everything. They want to think they already know what I'm saying. They want to, they want to just jettison curiosity and think they know what I'm saying. That's what I need to do is to be sensitive to that, that people want to assume they know what I'm saying. But I am a good scientist. I don't actually do the science, but I am committed to good science. You know, and I'm, and I'm rigorous and critical in my thinking. So it's, it's more about just not offending people and, 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 and triggering them, shutting down their curiosity. So I don't know if this answers your question, but I'm happy to pick up that conversation with you. I'm going to, yeah, go ahead. Him. Him, him? Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> I see you too. Um. Okay, so I might be misunderstanding this a little, but um, we can both agree, or like, at least I, I think that, um, what was I going to say? <laughs> <laughs> right, where you, you were talking about how like, we have to reconnect with nature to like reconnect with our society and stuff like that, and mm -hmm. I guess just become like whole again, but like, if you look all the way back, you know, of... Uh, Nature, I feel like, isn't all the same. Like, if you look at the nature somewhere like in Russia compared to the nature somewhere in Mexico, those are totally different natures. And those differences of people moving to up there created those differences between people. And those differences environmentally and physically have created the social tensions we have today. So, with that being said, would like nature then be the root of these issues we're facing today? Mm, that's a great wrong way of thinking about it. <laughs> it's a great way of thinking about it though. But what you're doing is mixing, you're mixing two different scales of which the, when I'm talking about it, I'm talking about how, I'm talking about evolutionarily, like over the, over the span of tens to hundreds of millions of years. And the nature is not different. That, the, the, the ecosystems might be, the habitats might be different, but the universals of nature, the ecological dynamics are still the same. They're universal. Nature has universal principles that get expressed different ways in different habitats and at different times. But, it's, but in terms of like how habitats affect human cultures, just be clear on which scale you're talking about. I'm talking about at the scale, like deep anthropological scale, and you're talking now about contemporary modern civilization scales. So yeah, if you live in a habitat, it's going to shape your culture locally. But humanity itself is shaped on the scale of tens of millions of years. Do you see what I mean? There's a difference. Like there's deep fundamental universals operating in us, in the ecosystems of Earth. But you're talking about regional differences. It's called niche construction, if you look at it. Like, but, you know... A beaver that builds a dam in Russia is going to is going to do the same. That species is going to have the same do the same thing. They're not culturally bound like humans are. Okay. It's just a question of being clear about what temporal and spatial scale you're you're examining this question. It's a great question. I didn't mean to say you were wrong. I just meant to say be clear on what scale. You're, talk, you're, you're referring to. I get you. It's just like misunderstanding. Yeah. Deep history, there's universals. Locally and regionally, you're going to have variation. Yeah. So how do those two separate scales relate to this singular continuity? Well, they're, 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 
differentiation on a continuum. Let me just show you real quick. So think about, um, here's the Big Bang, right? 13.8 billion years ago. The light and the energy and the, of the Big Bang cooled 380,000 years ago. You have this thing called the cosmic microwave background radiation where the tiny fluctuations of that energy slowly evolve into the first stars, okay? A couple hundred million years. Those evolve into the first galaxies. You know, they come together in these formations. Give this, how many, 10 billion years to evolve, and you get a certain solar system forming, a star, and around that star are a series of planets called the solar system. Earth's here, okay? On this Earth, you have um, continents that drift around and bang into each other, and life happens, it, it emerges, and then you get human beings emerge. Human beings have ideas, right? That's an idea. And they create civilizations and culture and art, right? So they do art. Do you see the continuity here? It starts here in the mystery of the Big Bang, before the Big Bang, right? And then this, this energy evolves, organizes itself into this thing called the cosmic wave background radiation, organizes itself into stars. Stars become galaxies, galaxies, solar systems, planets, continents, people, ideas, civilization today, right here. There's a continuity here. There's a continuous line. There's, it's, not, it's not this happened, then this happened, and they're all discontinuous with each other. It's the same story, right? Like, it's just that these ideas that we have are just complex manifestations of the same organizing principles. These are the universals. So there's things happening at this scale of human development that are imprinted on the human body. But then there are things that are happening at this scale inside these buildings that are to much smaller temporal scale that, create, that affect the, that inside this building right now that affect things. The point is it's one big continuum that, the, that that this conversation that we're having, the ideas that we're sharing, are part of this story. That's a, pretty, that's a pretty big idea. And when you feel that reality, it changes the world. You're, you live in a different world if you feel that reality. Have you heard about Universe 25? No. Okay. <laughs> can, can you tell me quickly about it? Yeah, it's, it, they took a bunch of rats and they gave them unlimited food, water, everything, except for they were just in a room. And um, at first- Did you say brats or rats? Sorry? Brats or rats? Rats. Okay. And at first, the population thrives, but then they quickly die off because there's no hardship. They, they just have the food, they have no incentive to reproduce, and they die. Okay. So do you, a lot of people, apply that to humans and say we are smart. Yeah, but we're not rats. Yeah, I know. I know. We're human beings, and we have ideas, and we, have, we can share stories about other things. Do you see what I mean? We can create other imaginative scenarios where that doesn't happen. That sets us apart from rats. Do you, do you think that the fact that, at least in the Western civilization, we have everything, you know, or you know, most of us have everything we need readily available, do you think that that is a downfall? I'm not a utopianist. I don't think what I'm saying here is going to solve every problem. I don't think that's, I don't think that's the point. But I think we can do better. I think we can treat each other better than we do now. I think the world can be better. That's not to say it's that what there won't be suffering and mistreatment and thievery and competition and all that. I'm just saying we can do better by reconnecting with our, our shared origin and our shared fate. I mean, come on. Sorry. Have a question? I have a question. 
Culture? Uh, I guess, generally speaking, I'm referring to the culture that we find ourselves in right now. Our Western, this culture that we all kind of share right now, outside. Go to Jacksonville if you want to see it. You know, like, turn on, a, turn on a TV or whatever. You want to see what I'm talking about? That's what I'm talking about. But I also mean it like the culture that we might create if we... If we, if we share a different narrative, and if the narrative's grounded in nature. That doesn't mean we start acting like rats. It just means if we know our, our, our origin story. Yeah, and I, you also said that, um, that the art influences the culture. And I'm, I'm really interested in art because like, I'm an artist. So like, what, are, what are you trying to encapsulate in the words that you produce with your My thing about art is that I think this job that I'm trying to do requires the help of art. Because art is how we communicate hard things. It's how we communicate creative, imaginative possibilities for the future. And I don't think science is really up for that. Science has a job to do. Interrogate nature, figure out what it is, and do the best, most rigorous thing you can. But it's, it's going to require artists to help us create a culture that can make meaning of that scientific knowledge. Does this, does this, does this answer your question at all? So that's why I'm like really, I, I want to empower artists, scientifically informed artists, who have a commitment to science, a scientific worldview, to help us create a culture that's more aligned with nature. Anybody else, before I get back to you, because? Way in the back, Kalili. But my questions are way different. But, like, I love nature. I shark fish all the time. I've had sharks for no other, like, research and stuff. Cool. And I get what you're saying about, like, watching the live stream and the thing that we're doing. But at some point, like, at some point, like, realistically thinking, like, as a commercial fisherman, I mean, that's 800 pound tuna fully dressed, but depending on the quality, 80 grand, 100 grand. Well, back when I did it, it was less, but yeah, go ahead. I mean, after paying, you know, gas, boat, crew, yeah. 20 grand paycheck. Yeah. At some point, like realistically, do you say to yourself, like, I mean, you put food on the table for thousands of people with fish that size, and you make yourself a living. Like, at what point does like I get connecting with nature? I, I mm -hmm. you know, I love sharks. Sharks, I think they're very misunderstood. I mean, one of the coolest creatures on on the planet for 400 million years. But at some point, the 20 grand paycheck is 20 grand. Paycheck. Look, I don't have a problem with making. A, <laughs> I, I I don't have a problem making a living from it. It's the, it's, the, it's the relationality that's lost. Watch Wicked Tuna. Have you seen it? Okay, but look at what they do. But look at what they do. They turn it into money. They don't care about the tuna. They care about the money that they think. I'm just saying that there's a more balanced way of appreciating what one's doing in the world than simply through an accounting of how much money it makes. And to feel what you're doing when you, do, when you participate in that, I'm not saying we shouldn't do that. I still do participate in that. But I do it and I feel the whole of my, I don't do it blind. And I know, look, I was a commercial fisherman. I know it's about mo money, man. It's about money, 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 money. Not that there's anything wrong with that, but I don't think that that's a long-term sustainable thing. You got to feel what you're doing. And then do it. But then you got to really feel it. And if you're not feeling it, you're not going to be able to take care of it. Yeah. It's kind of an indigenous thing, you know? Indigenous people lived, and they hunted, and they, but they also felt a deep sense of communion with the thing that was giving them life. I'm trying to restore that. And, if, and you have to admit that that's been lost yeah, in the commercial fishing industry. Maybe not in you, but we both know that, you know, if you're going to... Yeah. Okay, that's all I'm saying. Yeah, I 100% Yeah, so I'm not naive here, and I'm, you know, but I am being, like, I'm saying we've got to pay attention to what we're doing and, 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 and really feel what we're doing. Because those things are amazing, like you said. Yes. These, are, these are incredible animals. They deserve better than us just, you know. 
That's my okay, thing. I think that we need to break it up. Break out. Yeah, yeah. break so, it sorry. out. So if thank you, have... you all so much. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, okay, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, have a good night. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. I, uh, All right, thanks. I guess what I've been thinking recently in the box of, you know, I don't think, I don't know that we can do better. I don't, I don't know. Like, I, is this just our nature, you know, the way we do things right now and have done things? Um, but I guess this kind of like opened my mind. Down don't give up idea. hope. I don't think our nature is set yet. I think we've forgotten that that's our nature. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? I think you're judging us based on where we are right now. And I think if you use your imagination, you can imagine us having a different nature, a better nature, a nature that's actually in alignment with nature. That's what I'm hoping. I'm a very like um, optimistic, yeah. pessimistic, and analytical. <laughs> okay, I'm Fair not enough. pessimistic actually. I'm, I'm more of a realist, I like to think. I like to think that too, but I'm trying to be realistic. Like, not everybody's gonna like get this, yeah. but somebody's gotta do it. Well, I like, I, you opened my mind up to like a new, uh, new cool. idea. So. Yeah, have hope, man. <laughs> Did you have a question? I just wanted to say thank you. Oh yeah, thanks for coming. Oh, okay. Thanks for saying so. Appreciate that. You too. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank, Thank you. you. It's good talking to you. Thanks for your inputs. All right.